Hi, right, Year 12. This is the second video on the ontological argument. Um, after last time we looked at Anselm's first argument. Um, and we're going to look at the... We will look at Anselm's second argument in this video, but we're going to do it in the context of looking at this, Guanillo's criticisms of Anselm. So, um, uh, yeah, so we're going to look at this criticism that comes from another philosopher. He's called Guanillo. And we look at his criticism of Anselm, and then we're going to have a look at how Anselm responded and at how some other philosophers have responded to Guanillo. So this is one of the big criticisms of Anselm. I wouldn't say it's the best criticism. That's coming up later when we look at Kant, but this is an important one to include in essays. So um, it's all to do with an island, um, this criticism. It might seem strange, but it'll all become clear in a minute. So when we do the, if we did a lesson in class, I would start off with this thing. I get people to describe their perfect island in ten bullet points. So write what what would make an island perfect for you, you know, and people things people you could usually come up with are, you know, um, it's hot, sandy beaches, clear seas, um, palm trees, um, you know, all the things that you want in an island. Obviously, some people would differ in what they want, but um, but there's lots of things that we can imagine are good about an island. Right, let's get on with the, what, Anse, what Guanillo said. So Guan, Guanillo of Marmoutier, which is in France, I believe, criticised Anselm. He was a monk and a theist, so he believed in God, but he did not think that the argument worked. In other words, it, it, so this is quite an, a, a thing you come across quite often, that... that just because you, someone's a theist or a Christian, that doesn't believe mean that they believe every argument for the existence of God is a good argument. And so he didn't believe the ontological argument was a good argument. He wrote a reply to Anselm that was called In Behalf of the Fool. Now, uh, probably if he was writing it today, he would call it On Behalf of the Fool, because In Behalf of the Fool doesn't sound like good English today, but it was called In Behalf of the Fool. So if you remember... Uh, Anselm's argument was written as an argument addressed to the fool in one of the Psalms from the Bible, because it says in the Psalms, the fool says in his heart there is no God. So Anse uh, Guanillo's response was kind of arguing on, like, replying from the point of view of the fool. So he's trying to say, well, you're wrong. You haven't proved to this fool that there is a God with your argument. Here's what Guanillo argued. He said... Points up. Um, he said, we can imagine a perfect island which is better than any other that we can think of. So he says, imagine the best island ever. Now he says, if you think about it, according to Anselm's argument, according to Anselm's original ontological argument, if you applied that ontological argument to this island, the island must exist. Why is that true? Well, if you remember, the <coughs> ontological argument went like this. God is, the, the, is that than which nothing greater can be thought or conceived. Um, uh, if that thing existed only in our imaginations and not in real life, then we could think of something better, which is a real God. Uh, therefore, God must exist. Well, he's saying, well, why don't you just do that with an island? You could say, imagine the best island ever, an island than which you can conceive nothing better. Then, by the same logic, that island must exist. However, this is ridiculous. We know that just by thinking of a brilliant island, the best island ever, it might not exist. So this is a ridiculous point of view. So therefore he says, well, if the argument is wrong when it comes to the island, we kind of proved that this argument doesn't work for an island. So he says, well, Anselm is using the same logic to, to believe in God. Therefore, it does not work. Therefore, if it can't work for the island, then it can't work for God. And this is quite a nice uh, way of arguing, because it's an, it like Anselm's argument, it's an argument it's one of those reductio ad absurdum arguments. It's going to the absurd lengths. He's basically saying uh, this argument cannot work because if it does work, then then it prove then it must prove as well as proving God exists, it must prove that an ultimately brilliant island must exist. Whereas that's just ridiculous. You can't just say we can't just pr prove by definition that the best island we can think of exists because it could exist, it could not exist. So this is his point. I hope that makes sense. Uh, I'll just go through it again. So we can imagine a perfect island which is better than any other we can think of. So an island which is, which, than which nothing, no greater island can be conceived. 
According to Anselm's argument, this island must exist because if it's the greatest island, island that can be thought of, if it didn't exist, we could think of something better. But we can't think of something better, so it must exist. However, this is ridiculous. We know that any island we think of, however great, might exist and might not exist. So therefore, the, the ontological argument doesn't work when it comes to the island. And if it doesn't work when it comes to the island, it can't work when it comes to God, because it's exactly the same logic. That's his criticism. Now we're going to look at why uh, Gwynilla, how Gwynilla's argument can be criticised. Because although on, first, on the surface of it, it looks like a pretty good argument, there are actually some ways that we can uh, argue back in favour of the ontological argument. Here's an, a quote from Alvin Plantinga, very, very famous philosopher of religion, who will come up against, will come, uh, sorry, will uh, look at in a number of different areas in the course of philosophy, uh, especially in year 13. I guess I'm going to read this quote from him. He says, Anselm's proper reply, it seems to me, so his reply to, the best reply he could give to Guanillo, is that it's impossible that there be such an island. The idea of an island than which it's not possible that there be a greater is like the idea of a natural number than which it's impossible that there be a greater or the idea of a line than which none more crooked is possible there neither is nor could be a greatest possible natural number and the same goes for islands no matter how great an island is no matter how many nubian maidens and dancing girls adorn it there could always be a greater be a greater one with twice as many for example the qualities that make for greatness in islands, number of palm trees, amount of and quality of coconuts, for example, must most of these qualities have no intrinsic maximum. That is, there is no degree of productivity or number of palm trees or of dancing girls such that it is impossible that an island display more of that quality. Uh, so the idea of a greatest possible island is an inconsistent or incoherent idea. It's not possible there be such a thing. So that argument fails. So what's Alvin Plantinga saying here? Well, first of all, when he says Anselm's proper reply, it seems to me, Plantinga here is saying that though Anselm gives a reply, he doesn't think that's the best response. He thinks the response that he is giving here is better than Anselm's response. So he's saying this is what Anselm should have said in response to Guanilla. Um, we're going to look at what Anselm actually said in a moment. So he says it's impossible there be such an island. So he's basically trying to say that there, it's impossible, there is no such thing as the greatest island we can think of. Now, why is that? Well, he says the idea of an island than which uh, it's not possible that there be greater. It's like the idea of a natural number. The natural numbers are just the numbers, one, two, three, four, and so on. He says it's like the idea of a number than which you can't think of any greater. Well, that's impossible, right? Because there's always one more number. There's no biggest number because numbers just go on forever. In the same way, what he's trying to say is any island that you think of could be improved upon. Say if you said, well, I'm, my ultimate island would have eight five-star hotels that served the greatest food in the world. Well, someone else could just say, well, what about if the island had nine? Wouldn't that be better? Or you could say that, you know, mine, my greatest desert island has four different uh, beaches, each one deserted, each one uh, with amazing sand, beautiful sea. Or someone else could just say, well, what about mine's got five? So you can always think of something better. There could always be something better on the island. It could always be better. You know, someone could think of a lovely island that's amazing. And you could just say, well, you know, yours didn't have Wi-Fi. Imagine if it had Wi-Fi, that would be better. So you can always add things to make it better. You can always add more to an island. There's no such thing as a greatest island because you can always add more things to that island. You can always make it better and better and better. So his point would be here that the, the ontological argument only makes sense if we can actually properly say, conceive of, something than which nothing is greater. And with an island, that doesn't make sense. Let's look at the next slide, it might make it clear. So, um, Alvin Plantinga and John Hick, although they're quite different philosophers, um, again, uh, we'll look at uh, John Hick some more during the course. 
although they're quite different philosophers, they actually give a very similar criticism of Guanillo. They both say this, there is no such thing as the greatest island we can think of. We could add something to any island we can think of. One more beautiful beach, one more great hotel, one more amazing and rare form of wildlife. So they could, any island you think of could be improved upon. On the other hand, they say, God is the most perfect thing there is. We cannot add anything to make him better. And when you think about it, God is supposed to be all powerful, all loving, uh, all knowing. He's supposed to be the, he's the, the top of all those things so that you can't get any more powerful than all powerful. You can't get any more loving than all loving. You can't get any more knowing than all knowing. So with God, he is the maximum of these things. Whereas with an island, an island that you can never have a maximum island because it could always be better and always be better. Therefore, the idea is that the argument actually does work for God, but it doesn't work for the island. Because if you say the very beginning thing we see, and God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived, that makes sense for God. And therefore, the rest of the argument follows from that. If we go with the island and we say, imagine an island which is greater than any other island that can be conceived. Well, that doesn't make sense because there is no such island that's greater than any other island that can be conceived. So their point there is the logic of the argument works for God, but it doesn't work for an island because the islands and God are so, so, so different. I hope that makes sense. I think that's quite a nice criticism. I think it's, it's, it's certainly a more easy criticism to explain than Anselm's because Anselm's takes a little bit of digging into to understand what he means. It gets quite complex when we get to Anselm's argument. So that is uh, Alvin Plantinga and John Hicks' uh, criticism. Okay, so Anselm actually did reply to Guinello. So it's not the case that, you know, um, and it wasn't the case that Guinello criticised Anselm and Anselm didn't respond. No, Anselm did respond. However, to understand his response, we have to understand his second form of the ontological argument. And that's found in chapter 3 of the Proslogion. We said before that in chapter 2, we have the original form of the um, ontological argument. So the original form that we've already talked about is in chapter 2. And in chapter 3, we have the second form. Now, the second form is very similar to the first, but it adds a new dimension to it. So let's have a look at the second form of the argument in chapter three. Okay, so Anselm's second argument in chapter three of the Prosogion, and it goes like this. God is the greatest thing that can be thought of. That is the same as the first one. So he's starting with the same point, the same definition. Now, something which cannot be thought not to be is better than something that can be thought not to be. Now, in the first argument, we just had the idea that something that exists is better than something that doesn't exist, and therefore God exists. But he's going further here. He's saying, not just something that exists, but something that cannot be thought not to be. Something that you can't even, that couldn't even be conceived of as not existing. That is better than something which exists, but we could conceive of it not existing. It could not exist. Therefore, because God is the greatest thing we can think of, um, if God could be thought not to be, if it could be possible that he not exist, not just that he, 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 he does not that he doesn't exist, but he could even be conceived of as not existing, he is not the greatest thing we can think of. Therefore, God cannot be thought not to be. It's a weird thing to think of, but what he's trying to say is God not only has to exist, but he has to be the sort of being who it, it just would be impossible for him not to exist. He cannot even be conceived of as not existing. Now, this probably doesn't make any sense to you at the moment. So we have to look at some categories that Anselm is employing in his arguments. Here. Anselm says says that there are various different categories of things and a lot of ancient, a lot of the kind of philosophers over the years in the Christian world have used these categories. First kind of thing is contingent. Now this is a, a word you will use in many different places. You probably have used it in um, cosmological argument. It comes into play there. Contingent things are things that are caused. Because they exist due to causes, they could not exist if these causes were not there. In addition, they will go out of existence at some stage. Now, 
everything in the universe as we experience it is contingent. They're all people, they're, they were brought into existence, they will go out of existence. They could not have been brought into existence at all. All material objects, all living things. Everything in the universe that, that we experience is contingent. It's contingent because it was caused by something, we know everything is caused by something else. If it hadn't been caused, it wouldn't exist. So it, it would, it, even if it exists, it could be conceived of of not existing. It would be impossible. It would be possible for it to not exist. And it does exist, but it will go out of existence at some point. Second category of things are things that are impossible. So Ram Sam also says, as well as some things that are contingent, there are some things that cannot exist by definition because they involve some kind of logical contradiction, like a square circle. These things cannot be. So contingent things exist, but it would be possible for them to exist. They, either, they could exist, they could not exist. Um, and they'll go out of existence. Impossible things just simply cannot exist. A square circle is impossible. It's just a contra logical contradiction, and therefore there's no such thing. Third things, necessary things. Now, a necessary object, now sometimes people, in some philosophies, they put an opposition between contingent and necessary. But with Anselm, it's a little bit more complicated than this. For Anselm's purposes, a necessary thing is something which cannot not exist. They exist and cannot go out of existence. So in other words, they do exist, but and and because of their the way they were caused, or there's something about them which means they will never go out of existence. So contingent things will one day disappear. Necessary things will never go out of existence. Examples in Christian thought would include angels. Angels exist. They were created by God. They do not go out of existence. They don't die. The human soul. So that the part of us that lives on after death, according to religious thinkers, it was created by God. It cannot go out of existence. Now, those are the first three. The last one only God is in this category, and that is something that cannot be thought to not exist. For Anselm, only God is in this category. He is greater than a necessary being. Necessary things can't go out of existence, but they were brought into existence by God. Not only can he, can he not go out of existence, God, but it is not possible to conceive of, that is, think of him as not existing. That is what God is like, according to Anselm. He is most things are contingent, but God is on a different level to other things. He cannot even be thought of as not existing. He must exist by his very definition. Now, if we come back to our argument, if God is this kind of being, a being who must exist by his very definition, he cannot be conceived of as not existing, then the second argument applies to God. Because we're saying God is the greatest thing to be thought of, it's better to be this kind of being than to be not be this kind of being. It's better to be the sort of being who must exist by its very definition. Therefore, God is that kind of being. However, an island, however great an island, can never be that kind of being. Because all islands are contingent. It's part of the definition of an island that it is a contingent thing. Let's look at, uh, let's link, link this back in the next slide then. So back to Gwyneth. So Anselm's reply to Guenello is that an island and God are very different things. An island is a contingent thing. Even the greatest island you can think of, because it's still an island, and islands are a kind of contingent thing, all islands are contingent. Therefore, by definition, it could exist, it could not exist. Even the best island we think of could possibly not exist, because every contingent thing in the universe came into existence, but it could have not come into existence. It just, some of them did, some of them didn't. So any island you can think of is contingent. Even the greatest one you can think of is a contingent thing, so it may not exist. So you can't just put it de by definition, say it exists. On the other hand, God is not contingent. He is the greatest thing anyone can think of. Not the greatest example of a political, particular category. He's not, just the, he's not the greatest of this, the greatest of that. He is the greatest thing of all things. And it's only of this one thing that we can say, it cannot be thought not to exist. It's only this one particular category of thing that exists in that way. 
that it cannot even be thought not to exist. That is what makes it the greatest of all possible things. The greatest island is the greatest of one particular group of things, and that group is all the things in that group are contingent. God is the greatest of all things, and therefore he is not contingent. He cannot be thought not to exist. Therefore, this is the point, the ontological argument can only apply to God. It actually only works for one being, and that is God. For any other object, there is always the possibility that it does not exist. But God must exist. He is the one thing, because he's greater than everything else, therefore he cannot be thought not to exist. That is a deep and complicated argument. I hope it makes sense. My advice to you is you're not sure. These slides will be available to print off. Go through the video a couple of times, listen back to what I've said, see if you can annotate your slides. Okay, that is the video. So what I want you to do is um, write out in your own words, your own explanations of one, what's Gwinnello's criticism? How would you explain it? Secondly, how do Plantinga and Hick respond? Thirdly, what's Anselm's own response to Gwinnello? And include in Anselm's response the difference between contingent, necessary beings, and then God. What makes him different to other categories of being? So try and write out those three things in your own words. In the last video, I said put it down like this, point one, point two, point three. It might be good to do that because I always feel when you do it in bullet points or one, two, three points like that, it makes sure the logic is sound all the way through. It makes sure that you're not kind of, you're not waffling, you're not going off track. You're really making it almost like a mathematical structure to your argument. Okay, this is the last slide. If we did this in lesson, what I would usually do is get is give you these pieces, these pictures, and get you to cut them out and do your own kind of creative piece with them. So you can do that if you want. I'll put these on the slides. But just to think, these are some of the things that you need to include in your explanations. God is something that than which nothing greater can be can, can be thought. A, squ a square circle that's an impossible thing a god who could be who could not be thought not to exist so a god is a being who could not be thought not to exist you've got some angel an angel there which is an example of a necessary being oh this is the, the, i was trying to think what what was on here so the, these the two at the top top middle and top right go together a god who could not be thought not to exist and then in the thought bubble a god who could be thought not to exist well we're saying it's the one in the middle that's greater and therefore god must be that kind of being he can't be that kind of being the being that, that could be thought not to exist he can't be um contingent you've got the greatest island there and you could use that image to think about guanillo but also about well is there such a thing as a greatest island to think about um planting his arguments human beings there is it, it is possible for us to exist or not to exist we are contingent not like god and then you've got the, the, the key words contingent impossible necessary and then god is beyond all those he is something who you can't even think of as not existing well so this is some really difficult stuff guys i don't know how clear it's been um do let me know if you're struggling with the ontological argument i might be able to find you some readings that i can point you can send you away or point you towards that might help to make this clearer um, but yeah any questions do let me know okay thanks bye